Goodness. Anyway, um, uh, listen, a warm welcome uh, on, a, on a chilly Canberra morning uh, to people who've come from uh, uh, far and wide. Well, welcome to the Australian National University. There's been, there's been innovation and learning going on on this site, in this region, for thousands of years. And so the university, especially at major uh, uh, events, is always proud to acknowledge uh, and celebrate uh, the first Australians uh, on whose traditional lands uh, we're meeting and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures uh, in recorded human history. Um, you're here for a really special event. Uh, Asia Pacific Week uh, is about this university trying to reach out across the country, across the region, across the world, to bring together uh, people interested in um, learning about and shaping the future of knowledge about what's taking place uh, across the region. I'm looking to bring together the best and brightest of, uh, of the rising generation uh, from across the region and across the world. Um, our objectives here uh, are quite basic, but they're important objectives. First and foremost, we're just interested in expanding, deepening, extending uh, knowledge and understanding about what's taking place in the region. Second, we're trying to build up personal and professional links amongst uh, all of you as delegates, uh, between you uh, and uh, various uh, uh, speakers and participants uh, here, so that there's connections that you can hang on to and make use of uh, later on. And third, we're trying to strengthen organisational linkages. There's many organisations that have come together uh, to make this work. Uh, there's, and, and let me just single out one uh, uh, network of uh, organisations that's been particularly important in making uh, uh, this event come together, and that's the International Alliance of Research Universities. Um, there's a number of interesting uh, alliances of universities around the world. Th this one's pretty interesting. Um, apart from ANU, uh, it's uh, uh, the National University of Singapore, Peking University, the University of Tokyo, Berkeley, Yale, ETZ, ETH Zurich, Copenhagen, Oxford Cambridge. So it's an interesting mix uh, around the world and they've, they've, th th that alliance has played an important part in, uh, in pushing uh, uh, this week's meeting uh, uh, forward. You're a pretty interesting group. A hundred delegates chosen from a pool of 635 applicants from across the world, from uh, uh, 24 nationalities, across uh, 44 universities. So it's quite an interesting uh, mix of uh, uh, people. Uh, you've got, a, uh, I think, a quite extraordinary week ahead of you. Starting with uh, this, uh, this panel that's just about to uh, have the starter's uh, gun fired on it so it can get rolling, looking at the transition of, uh, transitions of power across the region. Um, uh, uh, through to a whole series of country and regional panels, uh, master blogging challenge, uh, a war game simulation, uh, the inaugural Q and Asia debate, uh, and of course, lots of social activity, um, uh, uh, which is really important to making these things work. Uh, but that coming together with a gala dinner uh, on uh, Thursday night at uh, Old Parliament House, um, uh, which should be a lot of fun, uh, and um, uh, one of our uh, particularly interesting uh, former Prime Ministers, uh, Malcolm Fraser, is going to be giving the address uh, uh, that evening. Um, there's lots of people who need to be thanked, um, uh, 
uh, for all the work behind a, an event like this. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to mention a few people because it would be, uh, it would be a crime against humanity if I didn't, <laughs> or a crime against nature or something pretty major, and, and deans don't like to do those sorts of crimes. Um, uh, I need to mention uh, 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 several of my colleagues to begin with, Peter Drysdale, Andrew Walker, Nick Farrelly, Darren Boyd and Jude Shanahan, all who are keen, key people amongst the staff of ANU for making this work. We shouldn't get too carried away with them. Nearly all of them get paid to do this. Um, um, uh, there's, I said nearly all of them because one of them was shaking his head. <coughs> He'll probably give you a commercial on himself in a little while. Um, um, but there's a few people who aren't paid to do this. And it gets even better, they pay for the privilege to do it. Uh, and that's the students. Sam Wall and his colleagues in the organising committee who have done the great bulk of the hard work and the imagining uh, to make this possible. And I just want to quickly read out, uh, read out names, and I'm sure you'll meet these folks uh, as the week progresses. So apart from Sam Wall, uh, Elizabeth Reside, Alex McAvoy, Rommel Varghies, Belinda Miller, Brody Warren, Feedy Malcolm, Henry Chung, Samantha Chong, Millie Green, Ippi Mondal, and Kyle Barnes. So big thanks to all those folks, and I look forward to meeting them, uh, the ones that I haven't had a chance to say hello to yet personally as the week progresses myself. Um, let me uh, um, just finish with a quick word uh, about us, the ANU. I mean, you're here in winter, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, uh, uh, Canberra, by Australian standards, has pretty miserable winter, uh, winters, but um, uh, you hear it might be a cold time, but it is an interesting time. There's lots of interesting things going on this week. Um, uh, apart from Asia Pacific Week, let me just mention a few of them. There's the 17th annual Asia Pacific Model UN Conference going on here this week. There's a special ANU uh, uh, Central Party School of the Communist Party of China symposium uh, on governance going on this week. There's the 40th Australian Conference of Economists going on. There's a workshop on interpreting historical sources in the Pacific. There's a seminar that's just started that I have to race to straight after this uh, on the government, government's, the Australian government's response to a very important uh, independent uh, review of our aid program. There's uh, the China update, which is the biggest, uh, most august um, uh, a co a conference on the Chinese economy uh, going on anywhere in the world outside China. Uh, there's the China Studies of Australia Association annual conference going on this week here. There's the 72nd Morrison Lecture on China, which I think you folks will be involved with. Um, there's uh, uh, a seminar on the importance of, uh, on, on the impact of terrorism on the India-Pakistan, on India-Pakistan relations. There's seminars on development, globalisation and Islamic finance in contemporary Indonesia. And there's the Indonesian students, uh, uh, postgraduate post students uh, workshop going on. So all of that's going on that, this week. So people are going to be racing in and out of multiple things. But I mention that because it illustrates something about which this university uh, is really proud and it's the scale of its historic investment in learning about Asia and the Pacific. In the English speaking world this is the largest single concentration of scholars working on this region and it's something we take really seriously we see ourselves as not just a national asset in this respect, 
but an asset for the whole region and the whole world. And so when I or the president of the university uh, are visiting in Beijing, uh, or visiting in London, or visiting in New York, or Tokyo, or Jakarta, or wherever it might be, we're always saying there's a lot of expertise and capacity here at the ANU, and if we can be any help to you, we're keen to. So keep that in mind, after you've had the fun of this week, after you escape back to wherever home is, keep in mind that we might see you again at some stage in the future. Perhaps as a, perhaps as a student, as a postgraduate student, perhaps as a visiting researcher, perhaps as colleagues, perhaps as users in some capacity or whatever, wherever your careers take you, perhaps as users of, of this huge knowledge base that's here. So we're keen to stay in touch with you by one means or another. Anyway, have fun, enjoy the week. I'm gonna be in and out with you uh, as the week progresses. Uh, it, it's time to get down to um, uh, 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 the serious business. So Sam, do I just switch off and hand over here? Is that how it happens? Over to you, colleagues. Hi, welcome to the first panel session of Asia Pacific Week. Uh, and uh, I'm Peter Drysdale. I'll be chairing the panel. Uh, this uh, panel is focused on a theme which uh, I think is rightly said to be one of the most important issues facing uh, international community today, which is the transition of economic and therefore political power in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, as uh, the economies of East Asia have grown, uh, especially of course recently China and, and India coming up there as well, uh, the structure of the international economy has clearly changed quite fundamentally. But with that, there are a whole lot of other changes that impact uh, on the world system as we've known it for the last 60 or 70 years. And how we manage those changes is going to be very important to our futures, a focus of incredibly important policy and professional interest over the next, well, certainly my lifetime and probably your lifetimes as well. Uh, and we've got a very distinguished panel to introduce us to the main issues that uh, this uh, brings before us today. And let me introduce the panel to you very briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, Ross Garner. Ross uh, is a distinguished professor of economics here at the ANU, uh, vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Melbourne, uh, former ambassador to China, uh, former advisor to the Australian government, the Hawke government on economic reform in Australia, uh, advisor to the Australian government currently on climate change. I might ask him to say a word or two about climate change later <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, and uh, a graduate uh, of the ANU some time back. Uh, Yiping Wang uh, is professor of economics at the um, Centre for Chinese Economic Research at Peking University in Beijing. Uh, also a professor here in the China Economy Program at the ANU. Uh, formerly Chief Economist for Asia of uh, Citigroup uh, and uh, also a graduate uh, of Renmin University and the ANU here as well. Uh, Deborah Browdingham is professor in the School of International Service at American University in Washington and a specialist on uh, Chinese impact on Africa in particular. And Hugh White is professor of strategic and defence studies here at the ANU and formerly senior advisor to the Australian government on defence policy. So this panel will uh, introduce the ideas. I'll speak for about 10 minutes initially, uh, join in a conversation later on, and then we'll open the floor up to your questions and comments. Ross. Thanks, uh, Peter. Well, I'm going to uh, put uh, the story of uh, uh, economic growth and state power into a long-term context to provide context for the rest of the panel discussion. Uh, of the four billion years of uh, history of this planet and the 
three billion years of history of life on this planet. Uh, the things we're talking about are relatively young. Our species is very young, a tiny bit of, uh, of uh, world history. And uh, civilization, the growth of large scale social organization and political organization, um, economic organization, um, the organization of people into states is a relatively recent phenomenon, mostly to do with the with the economic uh, change related to uh, development of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Uh, the, the growth of civilization has been entirely confined to a tiny period of equable climate in, uh, world, in the history of this planet over these last 10,000 years. Uh, almost inevitably, we're going to move outside uh, the, the climatic boundaries that uh, have uh, supported the growth of human civilization. So there are some interesting years ahead uh, which will uh, interrelate with the questions about economic growth and state power in complicated ways. Um, the, the, uh, uh, and in this relatively short history of our species and this tiny uh, period in which uh, large-scale human organization, human civilization has been present, the, the era of modern economic growth is shorter again, uh, dating really uh, uh, from the, the late 18th century, uh, the uh, revolution in probably most importantly in ideas about human organization. Uh, and a decisive point in all that was the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776 alongside the industrial and scientific uh, and ideological uh, revolutions uh, of that time. Uh, from then, uh, you started to get sustained modern economic growth uh, on, at a considerable rate uh, for the first time. Uh, that industrial activity related to science, related to uh, use of markets, the emergence of capitalism, uh, related to uh, rising uh, rates of saving and, and investment, spread from Britain to Western Europe in the early 19th century, uh, th then to the uh, overseas offshoots uh, of Western Europe. Um, which became more and more important. Uh, we, we began to see, in, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, for the first time, the emergence of very large technological and economic gaps between some states uh, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it uh, created a, a unique uh, phenomenon in world history, the, the phenomenon of, of imperialism based on differentials in economic weight and economic power. Uh, it was that differential in, uh, in per capita incomes, in levels of technology, uh, that uh, uh, allowed tiny countries like uh, the Netherlands and Belgium to exercise power over uh, very large populations, Britain over, uh, uh, over India. Uh, uh, and uh, at first, uh, uh, the modern economic growth uh, was, and, high, and, uh, and the pinnacle of this uh, hierarchy, new hierarchy of uh, techno technological levels and living standards uh, was confined, the upper echelons confined to Western Europe and its overseas offshoots in North America, Australia, uh, New Zealand in particular. Uh, the, through the 19th century, uh, that process strengthened, um, the differentials widened. The one exception to the concentration of, uh, of the new ideas about economic development, the, the new wealth, the new technologies in Western Europe and its offshoots was Japan. Uh, a very interesting story uh, how Japan and, well, how Asia in general were. Uh, uh, but Japan and China in particular responded uh, to the growth of power of the, of the West. Uh, China historically had been the world's most, um, most successful state and economy. 
uh, it was so successful that there was great confidence amongst the Chinese elite uh, that uh, nothing could be better than what had developed there uh, for thousands of years. Uh, uh, until uh, the Industrial Revolution in the West, um, the, uh, Japan uh, had been a, uh, an honored um, uh, subordinate of China in the Sinitic world of East Asia, uh, with a, an honored place, uh, the Chinese uh, emperor corresponding to, with the Japanese emperor in classical Chinese, the Chinese uh, scholars never referring to Japanese as barbarians, unlike uh, people from other civilizations, because they were cultured uh, in the Sinitic civilizations, but, uh, uh, but, but clearly subordinate. Well, all of that broke apart because uh, Japan, uh, being less strong than China, less confident, after a very difficult internal struggle, uh, decided that uh, the retention of its autonomy uh, required adoption of many of the successful new ways of the West. And so you had the Meiji Restoration. Meiji originally brought to power uh, as a reaction against uh, the shogunate uh, uh, leaders who were wanting to uh, uh, accommodate the new power of the West. But in power, the, the restored uh, Meiji court uh, came to the same conclusion as the people that they had uh, overtaken uh, and uh, embarked upon uh, the deep integration into the, the modern economy. And, and, and that was reflected very quickly in an acceleration of economic growth in Japan. So soon, within a few decades, Japan was one of the high income, high technology countries that had much more power than other countries. And so that it became part of the system of imperialism with the invasion of North China, Korea, uh, Taiwan, um, eventually culminating in the tragedies of uh, the 1930s and uh, 1940s. Well, that was the, the world of modern economic growth and power until the Second World War. Uh, the Second World War busted things apart uh, for, for, uh, in fundamental ways for reasons I won't go into. And in the last half century, we've had one after another uh, countries uh, of what we came to call the developing world uh, setting out to absorb the wisdom uh, that underlay uh, modern economic growth and technological change. Um, the, the, the cre and, and we've learned in the last half century that uh, there's nothing culturally specific or ethnically specific about economic success. It happens anywhere where you've got an effective state, you have to have an effective state, uh, and uh, you adopt certain policies that uh, are consistent with the absorption of, of technology, opportunities for trade, uh, um, uh, deep integration into an international economy. So we, we first saw the acceleration of economic growth in a few smaller economies in East Asia, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, uh, the, de the really decisive shift was the uh, uh, adoption of open policies and market-oriented policies. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, um, uh, 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 defined as having commenced in December uh, 1978, when Deng Xiaoping got the numbers in the uh, uh, the uh, third plenum of the 11th. Uh, um, uh, uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party. Uh, uh, now scholarship is, is telling us to uh, uh, be a bit careful about uh, single uh, points in time, but uh, certainly since 1978 uh, China has been on a <coughs> policy of consistent opening up uh, market-oriented reform, enjoying rapid economic growth. and. Uh, uh, several other big countries in the region adopted um, policies consistent with modern economic growth in the subsequent couple of decades, most importantly uh, Indonesia and I see decisive uh, events in the mid-80s uh, and uh, India uh, with uh, when Manmohan Singh was uh, 
uh, finance minister in the economic crisis of macro crisis of 1991 uh, began a path of rapid economic growth. Um, in the uh, uh, in the long t well. Uh, the newcomers to economic growth could grow more rapidly than the pioneers ever could because they can grow through absorption of, of uh, technologies, ways of organisation that have already been developed somewhere else. That can happen more quickly than inventing new things as you go along, as Britain did uh, in, from the late uh, uh, 18th uh, century. And so uh, uh, the, the, the rapid growth of the, the new uh, Asian economies uh, uh, engaged, newly engaged, well, the countries that are newly engaged in modern economic growth uh, has been uh, exceptional in historical terms and it's uh, leading to a rapid catching up of average incomes uh, in the major uh, Asian developing countries uh, with those uh, of the West. Um, uh, that acceleration or, the, or that uh, catching up was accelerated by the uh, uh, global financial crisis where fundamental weaknesses in uh, uh, the political systems and uh, financial systems of Europe and the United States uh, led to a change in trajectory, uh, probably, well certainly a long term one, possibly a permanent one of slower economic growth in those economies without affecting at all uh, the momentum of economic growth in China, India, Indonesia. So within a big historical story, the global financial crisis, the great crash of 1908, uh, 19, 2008. <laughs> there was another great crash in 1908, but the great crash of 2008 uh, was, was an important additional turning point. Um, just uh, uh, one consequence of that is that uh, catching up of China in scale with the United States is proceeding uh, more quickly than people had anticipated before. Happening so quickly that uh, it's taking uh, uh, people who think about power relations by surprise. And so uh, uh, we've got to develop new ways of thinking about the international system more quickly than we might have otherwise uh, have had to do. Uh, China has already, well, some time ago, overtaken Japan, the power relationship between China and Japan has gone back to something more like it was through most of, uh, of history and that requires some adjustment in both China and Japan. J China's not used to uh, being more powerful than Japan. That leads to a certain scratchiness that uh, 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 wouldn't be there if uh, China was more confident about its, uh, uh, its position. Uh, and in, in Japan, of course, there's, there's uh, quite a, a, a large uh, uh, adjustment in ideas uh, re required. Um, the catching up with the United States uh, will be more rapid than people think, uh, not only for the reasons I've mentioned, because, but because uh, once you reach a stage of economic development that uh, the economist uh, uh, Lewis uh, called the turning point in economic development, uh, you get a, a rapid increase in real incomes as labour uh, becomes scarce. You get average incomes rising more rapidly uh, than, uh, uh, th than simple macroeconomic rates of growth would suggest and that accelerates the catching up. Uh, so sometime, not very long in the future, uh, China will be as big an economy as the United States. By 2030, it's quite likely that China will be as big as uh, Europe and the United States uh, combined, and uh, that has some pretty clear implications for power relations that will be explored later in the, in the panel. But that's not the end of the story of uh, change in Asia. Uh, growth momentum in India uh, is very powerful. Uh, when we first started taking a close interest uh, here at the ANU in Indian economic reform and growth, in, I think uh, we established the South Asia uh, Economic Research Centre to monitor these things uh, back in about 1993. Uh, after a conversation I had with my uh, friend and sometime uh, colleague uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, um, we uh, 
Oh, it was, it was, we used to say at that time that uh, India wouldn't be like China because its savings rates were so much lower that that would place limits on levels of investment that uh, were consistent with the economic stability. But we found in India, as in actually in many places in East Asia and elsewhere, that uh, rates of, uh, of savings and investment are, uh, uh, to a considerable extent, uh, uh, endogenous. Uh, and uh, Indian savings rates and therefore sustainable investment rates have been rising rapidly with rapid economic growth. Uh, and so uh, uh, from a much lower base, there's now very strong growth momentum uh, in India. Uh, uh, all countries uh, that, have, that have become rich uh, have seen uh, a demographic transition as incomes have risen. The Chinese democratic, uh, demographic uh, transition much more dramatic uh, than uh, those of any other country because you've got imposed on that a powerful uh, um, set of state policies, uh, antenatal uh, state policies. Uh, in India, you've got uh, fertility and population growth declining very rapidly, but in a less forced way. One consequence is that uh, India uh, soon will be a more populous country uh, than China, and so the combination of uh, a different demography and a very strong momentum in economic growth uh, is, it will mean that China will not stay forever uh, the largest economy on this earth. I'll leave it at there. Thanks, Ross, for providing that uh, perspective on the longer-term change in in uh, in Asia and 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 in in global civilizations. You've become very thoughtful in uh, recent years. I think even more thoughtful in recent years, probably because of dealing with climate change. But uh, let me now turn to Yi Ping Wang. China is obviously a big part of the story, even though, as Ross said, uh, it won't be the biggest part of the story for all time. Um, Yi Ping will tell us a little bit about the Chinese economy story. Thank you, Peter. Um, I will focus a lot more um, on uh, short-term issues. Um, let's uh, look at, instead of billions of years, let's look at what happened the last 10 years. <laughs> I, think, I think what uh, happened uh, during the last 10 years, uh, probably most important event from my point of view, is uh, the fact that China has uh, um, risen from a small country economy to a large country economy. Now, for those who uh, do not study economics, I have to tell you, large country e uh, economy is not defined according to territory or according to population size. It's defined according to your influence on the global economy. Whether you're a big country or whether you're a small country, if a change in your demand and supply behavior does not affect the global markets, does not affect other countries significantly, than you are a small country. So I would argue in most cases, China was a small country economy, perhaps 10, 15 years ago. But today it's a large, con it's a large country economy, as Ross mentioned. China overtook Japan, uh, became the second largest economy um, at the end of last year. And if you look at the IMF statistics, the purchasing power parity number, China probably will become the largest economy um, by the year of 2016. So it's obviously a very big country. But I think more importantly, what I think the change, the real change, was whatever China does is going to have a big impact on the global market. And in China, we have a saying, whatever China buys, it's becoming expensive. Whatever China sells, it's become very cheap. So that's a good way of understanding what large country economy is. I mean, I can give you some, um, some evidences, examples you already know very well. Number one, the commodity markets. China consumes a lot of commodities in the, um, in the world, and the most particular comp component. I mean, obviously, you heard lots of iron ore, copper, um, and so on. China accounts for something like more than 50% of the total consumption of cement, coal, and iron ore, obviously. I um, mean, that's the reason is, is, is simple, because we are making lots of investment. And one simple number to remind you that, that the housing we are building in China um, these days 
every year, the annual construction of the housing is greater than the total housing stock you have in Australia as a whole. So every year we be, we're, ma we're making lots of investment, we consume lots of commodities. Number two, um, the consumer ma ma goods market, I think that's pretty simple. Last year, China overtook the US to become the largest manufacturer in the world. So whatever China produces becomes cheap. That's pretty simple. If, you, if you're thinking of buying some souvenir in Australia and taking back home, just be careful, check the brand name. It may say, <laughs> made in China. Um, number three, um, the FX market, the foreign exchange market. Um, this is actually a very interesting area. Everybody is talking about RMB exchange rate. Um, the funny thing is uh, this exchange rate is not flexible. The currency is even not convertible. But if you look at uh, what happened in the global markets, there are lots of attention on the currency. And that's in part because of the competition in the manufacturing market. But also, if you look at, for instance, the study by Professor Taka Ito from University of Tokyo, he, he estimated the importance of different currencies in influencing um, foreign exchange uh, uh, decisions in Asia. And his conclusion was today, RMB is as important as the US dollar for um, the Asian exchange rate policy decisions. But anyway, there are lots of discussions and some people argue maybe we are seeing the beginning of the RMB block um, in the region, whether or not that's a controversial issue. Uh, the, most of, the, 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 the most dramatic argument that we heard the last couple of years is the proposal to, uh, for US and China to form a group, uh, a group of two, the so-called G2, for China and the US to jointly manage internet, important international economic issues. The Chinese government rejected the idea um, simply because, well, there are many reasons, but we think we're not ready yet. But I think that does not deny the fact that China and the US are becoming probably two of the most important countries. Some people would argue, well, China and the US sit together, they may not be able to resolve lots of problems the world faces today. But certainly if China and US cannot sit together, cannot agree on important issues, it's very unlikely we would be able to resolve some of the important challenges. So I think that highlights um, the importance of China, that's probably enough. What I'd like to share with you next, obviously, is that the, the, dif the difficulties that we're facing um, for China to play a more important role in the international um, uh, affairs. Um, there are certain, certainly a number of uh, um, disconnections or gaps between certain, certain things. Number one, how things look like and the realities in China. So for instance, people think China is the second largest country and it should play a much greater role in the international uh, uh, community. The Chinese would say, well, we're still a developing country. Our GDP per capita is still below 5,000 US dollars. It's very difficult for China to play a leadership role when we really f we have to focus on poverty alleviation, on development, and on structural transformation. The biggest question I think we face in China, you may think China is the most glorious economy in the world. We are very mu much worried about the sustain sustainability of uh, um, economic growth. Um, some, as I said, IMF would predict China could overtake the US in a couple of years. But people, look, people like Russ, who spend lots of time looking at the history, would tell you that uh, that kind of straight line extrapolation would not nece necessarily always true. For instance, in the 80s, many people expect Japan to become the world's largest economy. That never happened. In the 50s and the 60s, we thought the Philippines economy would be the strongest economy in the region. Uh, that is yet to happen. So lots of things that we have to be to keep in mind. What, how things are doing well at the moment does not necessarily will continue. Well, of course, there is a probability it can continue, but it really depends on lots of things uh, we have work we have to do. There's a, that means also there is a big gap between expectations of the international community and the willingness of the Chinese society, what we can contribute.
um, and there are lots of argument, uh, uh, debate certainly in China, what, uh, what contributions we can make. Are we ready to do uh, this uh, um, contribution? Um, I will give you um, three issues. Um, we'll, 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 we'll discuss with you um, three issues. I think we, the challenges we have to face. Number one, is growth sustainable? Um, now, we have managed an average GDP growth of 10% a year for 30 years. Um, if you just look at the numbers, you would say, well, why not? If 30 years is possible, then another 30 years would be possible. But in fact, if you listen to what our Premier Wen Jiabao once said, we have a big problem in the growth model. The, our growth model is number one, un, um, un, uncoordinated, unbalanced, inefficient, and unsustainable. Well, I'm not going to uh, bore, you, bore you with uh, um, num, num, the, the challenge, detailed challenges that we, we're facing. But in particular, uh, just to say, or I will say, structure is very imbalanced. We don't. We spend too much money on investment. We 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 incur too large current account surplus. We don't consume enough, and we rely too much on commodities. And you would understand if I tell you, as I told you, we consume already more than half of the global commodities today, as our income per capita is only five thousand U.S. U.S. dollars. If we don't change our growth model. What happens when our GDP per capita becomes 40,000 US dollars? Uh, most people would say, well, the world cannot support that. And that means we have to make lots of change, changes. The 12 five year plan just announced in March this year highlights the importance of transforming the economic development pattern. Basically, the idea is we need to make the growth model sustainable. We need to consume less commodities. We need to make investment more efficient. And we may need to make economic structure much more balanced than it is today. So for instance, our current account surplus is big. Um, for a small country, it's not a problem. For a large country, we are already facing lots of international um, dispute and the conflicts and so on. So if we cannot adjust our economic structure, we will face a serious problem about the growth sustainability. My own view is I'm relatively more optimistic. I don't think that's not, it's not possible to resolve these problems. Although we spent the last five years trying to re resolve these problems, problems became worse. Um, the reason why I think I'm more optimistic now is because we are seeing lots of changes in the domestic market. Lots of in imbalance problems we suffer today um, actually rooted in the, um, the distortions in the factor markets, in the markets for labor, for capital, for land, for resources, and so on. So last 30 years, in a way, we like supporting growth by implicitly subsidizing producers, investors, and exporters. That made our growth very strong, but at the same time made the structure of the economy very unbalanced. So I think if we really start to make efforts like the government is start to do now, adjusting the resource prices, maybe we'll introduce a market-based interest rate and exchange rate. And the labor market is already adjusting. Um, they actually, these may generate some negative impact on the macroeconomic structure, like pushing up inflation pressure. But it's going to make a big change impact on rebalancing the economy. We already start to see consumption is picking up because of household income is uh, rising. So I think it's possible, but that's still a question mark and there's certain, certainly uncertainty whether growth can continue at a very rapid pace in the next 10 years. The second issue I think we have to face is really the influence and the responsibility. We are already a large country, but in many areas we still hold some kind of small country mentality. So for instance, the exchange rate. When the US, Europe, and some other countries criticize our exchange rate policy, some of our experts would say, well, this is because the US doesn't like us. Because there are lots of countries in the world who have um, distorted exchange rate. Why they pick us, they single us out? This is an important question. 
Uh, I think one of the issues we have to realize is when you're a small country, other countries pay less attention to you. When you're a big country, you distort the global, uh, uh, the global uh, economic structure. And that's something we have to come to realize. We are a big country now. We have to have a large country mentality when we decide economic, economic policy. The last uh, issue I will, will, will finish with is really um, the future direction we want to influence. Um, the, the, the international community now demands China to make positive contribution in the current transformation of the international economic system. Um, but I think we're still kind of debating um, our, among ourselves. China certainly was a main beneficiary of the globalization process. So we like open trade, uh, 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 open economy, free trade, free flow of capital, and so on. But at the same time, conspiracy theory is very popular in China. Whenever you talk about an issue, international issue, there are always experts who say, well, this is just a simple reason they want to destroy us. And that makes it very difficult. Um, and so I think this is um, an issue we have to continue to debate and we have to, to, to reach a consensus view what we want to do and what we con want to contribute. But the good news is our leaders are already pretty clear. Uh, as President Hu Jintao already said, we not only want to support um, the globalization process, we want to keep a peaceful um, a development. The most importantly, we want to contribute to a, not only a harmonious society within China, but we want to contrib contribute to the building of a harmonious world. Thank you. Fancy Ping Ping's conclusion reminds me of the aphorism that the future is with us. Uh, China is already, in, forget about 10 years out or 15 years out, China's already a big economy and its impact uh, on the rest of the world is large and one of the big questions we'll have to come back to in the panel is, is how prepared, how adequate the domestic response in China is to managing that circumstance. Uh, but Deborah will now talk about some of that impact uh, beyond China. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for inviting me here. This is uh, such a pleasure for me to be in uh, chilly Canberra, because Washington, where I'm from, is horrible in the summertime. So this is it's nice to be able to breathe. So um, I think my presentation follows pretty nicely from uh, the last presentation, because one of the issues that was raised right at the end is China's position as a responsible stakeholder and part of the global economy, and what kind of role is China going to play? And one of the places where we've been seeing a lot of criticism of China's role is in Africa. Now, how many of you are familiar with China's role in Africa or some of the criticism that you read about in the newspapers? Okay, so people have been reading about this. Maybe you read, read The Economist and you saw the special issue on, or the special, uh, section on China and Africa a few weeks ago. Well, um, I'm going to talk about China going global in Africa. And uh, some of the arguments I'm going to make are that this is a much less well understood relationship than we think. Uh, it's partly because China is not very transparent, so the terms of the relationship are not known very well. Uh, but it's also because the uh, abil ability of the internet and the media to circulate mythologies about what is going on there is really quite remarkable. And when you start to dig in more deeply into a lot of the stories that you think you believe, uh, you find that actually it isn't quite like that. So let me start out. Um, I wrote a book which was published uh, late in 2009, in which I look at a lot of what we think we know about China, the conventional wisdom in Africa, and explore that more deeply and show that it's not exactly the way you think. And I want to start out today by telling a story, and it begins once upon a time. So once upon a time, there was a very large, very poor, but resource-rich country that was just emerging from a period of intense conflict. And this country, decided to focus on development. We need to modernize our ports. We need to develop our energy and our infrastructure, they said. And soon they had a visit from a wealthy Asian country that had already become a major consumer of their oil. And this Asian country said to them, we'll make you a bargain. We'll give you a line of credit worth $10 billion. 
And you can use that credit to have our companies help you develop your energy infrastructure and your other uh, infrastructure, perhaps develop and modernize your mines. Now, many in this poor country were very worried about this offer. It was intensely controversial. But nonetheless, they agreed to this bargain, and the work began. Now, in this room, I imagine there are quite a few people who know which two countries I'm talking about here. You have some ideas? How many people think they know? Ooh. OK, well, I'm hearing some things. Anybody? Any other guesses? OK, you all have some thoughts in your mind about who these might be? Good. Lots of murmurs going on. <laughs> Now, one country I do hear repeated over and over in the audience is China. <laughs> Good job. One of the countries is China, yes. China is a large, poor country with oil. And the other country is Japan. And the time, it's 1978. China is just emerging from the Cultural Revolution. And when Japan and the Chinese government were discussing this, it was very controversial in China. In fact, when these negotiations began, uh, Mao Zedong was still in power. But when they were concluded, it was Deng Xiaoping, China's great reformer. So there are several lessons, I think, that come out of this. First of all, it's a history lesson. <laughs> for some of you. Uh, but also, it's, um, it tells us that China's relationship uh, in Africa, where the same kind of model is being used, is something that China learned about from other countries, and something that was used successfully to help China jumpstart its own economic development in the days when China was not creditworthy and couldn't borrow on the international markets. Now, on hearing of one deal along these lines that was done in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Financial Times wrote, Beijing has thrown down its most direct challenge yet to the West's architecture for aiding African development. And there are a lot of challenges involved in China's relationship with Africa. Uh, and most of what we read about is so deliciously frightening uh, that it sells more uh, magazines, I think, than Princess Diana used to when she was on the cover. So all you have to have on the front of The Economist is a picture of China and Africa to sell more copies, I think, or China doing anything, <laughs> really. So these are some of the pictures that have come out, and they're not even all Africa. One down here is, is from Latin America, clearly, that's in, in uh, Rio. And uh, this picture of what looks like Jesus up there with the dragon is even this resonance of uh, Christian and Western civilization being under threat by the dragon. So we do see a lot uh, of fear-mongering, I think, about this. Uh, and in Africa, China does present a challenge. And why is that? It's for several reasons. One is that uh, Chinese companies have lower environmental and social standards. They're about the level that they are in China. Um, and this is a lot lower than Western companies in general, but not always. Uh, Chinese companies are probably more willing to pay bribes, and that's because it's only been very, very recently that China even had domestic legislation that made foreign bribery illegal, which is something that the OECD countries had to do in 1997. China's now done that, but we don't know whether or not it will be enforced. Um, Chinese companies usually pay lower wages, and uh, the safety standards in their operations, their mines, and so on, are more problematic than those from almost any other country, with, with the exception of African <coughs> investors. Chinese immigrants and traders are proliferating in Africa, and this is something that causes a lot of worries uh, in the competition that they provide. The substandard and counterfeit goods that we've experienced in the West, they're also flooding into Africa, and these are, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, safety standards, these are worries. Um, and then from the point of view of governance, there's no economic or political conditionality. Uh, so that China will sell arms to any government that's willing to or able to pay for them. Um, and then business and loans are not conditioned on any sort of governance criteria. So all of these do present challenges, and, and uh, I think we're quite aware of this. But 
The biggest challenge may be this. Uh, in many parts of Africa, governance is poor, but Africa is actually quite rich. Now, we haven't figured out a way to link Africa's riches to its development, and the Chinese are actively trying to do just this. And they're not trying to do it out of altruism. When we look at that first loan that Japan made to China, this was not foreign aid. This was a market-based loan. It was a consortium of Japanese banks that put this loan together. It was not foreign aid. Uh, and most of what China is doing in Africa is also not foreign aid. It's uh, cooperation with a lot of different instruments. Now, one example in Niger, the Chinese, uh, Chinese are now investing in oil in Niger, as well as uranium. And the Chinese ambassador was being interviewed by the Financial Times, and he said, you know, this country has already seen uranium extraction for nearly 40 years. That's by the French. But when one sees that the direct revenues from uranium are more or less equivalent to the export of onions every year, there's a problem, and we can do better, he said. <coughs> now, of course, the jury's still out on whether the Chinese can do better, but that's what they're promising to do. Now, how big is this involvement in Africa? It's actually quite large and has grown very, very rapidly, as many other things. We've been hearing about China over the past 10 years. Well, this is China over the past 10 years in Africa. And so this is it's quite dramatic. When you look at trade um, in 2000, um, it was uh, very, very low. And I don't know, 20 um, million or so. Um, and then when we get to 2008, we have trade total trade over $100 billion. So it's uh, an enormous increase. Uh, 2009, it shrank somewhat because of the global financial crisis. But in 2010, the figures aren't there. It's gone back up again above the 2008 figures. So China is now the largest trading partner of the African continent. Um, in terms of FDI, these figures are much more problematic because uh, the, the data that we have for FDI is not very good. But nonetheless, if you look at the actual figures, uh, from 2007 and 2009, we can see that Africa is actually a fairly small part of Chinese overseas investment. In 2007, it was about 6%. In 2009, it was 4%. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's growing as Chinese investment is growing around the world. Uh, now, we hear about Chinese oil interests in Africa. Um, they are considerable. Um, what we see here are places where there's a Chinese presence in one way or another. That doesn't mean they actually have an oil project there, but they're exploring. Um, and this is already a, a couple of years old. So we can see it's quite a few continents here. But it's much more than oil. They're actually interested in a lot of different commodities, naturally, uh, but also manufacturing investment. There's some exploration into agriculture, small scale, large scale. We can see uh, down here is a big um, spinning mill that was set up in Mauritius. Um, telecommunications, as Huawei uh, company up there. But one of the areas that is much less remarked upon is Chinese interest in construction and infrastructure. And what we see here, are, this is a picture I took in Tanzania, and there's um, this building in the back is being built by a Chinese company, and they're um, cooperating with a lot of other companies as they're be doing this for the government of Tanzania. Um, up here is a picture of a road being built that was built by the Chinese, and there's one that's uh, being built down at the bottom. And this is not just being financed by the Chinese government. It's being financed by a, a host of um, different actors. The World Bank, the uh, United States Aid Agency, as other uh, donors have untied their aid. The Chinese are winning their contracts. So this shows the revenues to Chinese companies from construction in Africa. In 2002, 1.2 billion. In 2009, $28 billion. So this is a huge market and huge interest and a huge need in Africa. Now, when we look at official development assistance, it's actually quite small. And these are figures that I put together. Um, and the, since then, the Chinese have released a, a little bit more um, data on this, though not very much. In 2008, in terms of disbursements, Chinese foreign aid was about $1.2 billion, um, a lot lower than, for example, the UK, Germany, uh, and the other development partners in Africa. Now, this is a map of Chinese aid agreements uh, from 2006 and 2007. Um, the countries that have natural resources are shaded here, uh, but all of the, the dots and circles um, are 
aid agreements that were made during those years. And what you can see is, this is only in Sub-Saharan Africa, what you can see is basically the aid agreements happen everywhere. Uh, and in terms of the volume, it's also consistent with this. Uh, they're not particularly large to resource-rich countries. Um, and that's because aid is given for political reasons, much more than for economic reasons. Now, when I, I've traveled around a lot in Africa. I've been to many, many countries uh, for my research. And these are some of the things that I often hear. Um, Africans ask me, they say, you know, the West is very critical about Chinese engagement in Africa. But what about the West's engagement in China? Uh, China's record on human rights and democracy is not stellar. Um, and yet China's a top destination for investment from OECD countries um, and trade. And in general, the West takes the position that business is business when it comes to China. Uh, but when China uses these principles to invest across Africa, the, the West says, you can't do that. You know, you're being bad. Um, and Africans say, well, why is there this double standard? You know, the West can invest in China with all of its challenges for human rights, and yet when China invests in Zimbabwe or Sudan or, or other countries in Africa, um, we say this is not acceptable. So the last thing I want to leave you with is um, a few points about why China is different than the West when it comes to Africa. They're different for first, the first reason is because uh, Chinese foreign policy principles are different than most, than my country, for example. Um, in China, there are five principles that govern foreign policy. They're called the principles of peaceful coexistence. And two of those are especially pertinent. One is this standard of uh, respect for state sovereignty, of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. And so we can see in my country, in the United States, we don't have that in our foreign policy. <laughs> in fact, you might say it's a principle that we must interfere uh, in internal affairs of other countries. And the second thing about Chinese foreign policy that's relevant is that mutual benefit, that uh, foreign relations should be based on mutual benefit. And again, when we think about um, our relations between the North and the West and Africa, we are thinking more that it should be based on charity. It should be based on foreign aid rather than mutual benefit. So we're shocked when the Chinese say, you know, we're doing a lot of deals uh, and we're not talking about foreign aid so much. We're talking about cooperation. So that's different as well. The second is that China's ideas, the core ideas about development are different than they are in the West. In the West, we have uh, recipes for how Africa should develop. And those recipes change every decade or so. And some of us in this room are old enough to remember these old recipes. Back in the 1960s, we said it was infrastructure and industry. <laughs> uh, in the 1970s, we said it, it's basic human needs. In the 1980s, it's structural adjustment and policy change. In the 1990s, it's all about governance. In the last decade, the Millennium Development Goals and social spending. So the recipe changes every decade. But for the Chinese, it's pretty simple. Uh, invest in manufacturing and agriculture, and yao shang fu, xian shou lu. If you want to become wealthy, first build a road. Now, China is the third point. They have experience as a recipient of aid and loans from the West. And so they know how this helped them to build their own country, and they're using this knowledge in Africa. But the final point is that China in, is in a region, and that is the region of East Asia. And in Asia, there is a model, the East Asian developmental state. Japan started out this way, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, and now China following this of state intervention with instruments uh, to build the economy. And in Europe, and particularly in the United States, we're much more believers in liberalism. We don't intervene nearly as much. And so that, again, makes China different. So um, this is just a, an overview. If you're interested in any more, I wrote a book on this. And I have a blog in which I try to look at the conventional wisdom on a regular basis. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, Deborah. Deborah's story of the reach of China into Africa reminds us powerfully of the connect between uh, economics and politics. And uh, to conclude the panel, uh, I'll ask Hugh White to say a little bit about the interaction, the connect between the economics and the politics. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be uh, with you guys. And
great to be on this panel. Um, I usually claim to be the gloomiest person in any room. Um, <laughs> And that's because what I do is to study the way in which international society goes wrong. The role of armed forces in international affairs, the circumstances in which uh, cooperation between states breaks down and they start fighting with one another. And there's an awful lot of work done about why that happens and how that happens, but right at the heart of the course, a very simple idea. And that is that um, states exist in a society. It's a, it's a matter of relationships between states and that one of the things, perhaps the most important thing that underpins their relationships is their relative power. Now what we've heard this morning from our three very distinguished panellists is different aspects of the story of the most remarkable shift in relative power, a relative power between states, possibly in history. And this is posing immense challenges for everyone about how we manage relations between states and in particular how we manage relations between states to avoid armed force becoming too big a part of the way those relationships function. And I just want to touch, a, touch for a few minutes on how those issues are, are, are travelling in Asia at the moment and finish by saying a bit about what they mean for countries like Australia. I'm not going to look back four billion years like Ross, I'm just going to look back 40. <laughs> But, but next year, 1972, 2012, gee, we're having different trouble with those decades, aren't we? 2012 will mark the 40th anniversary of Nixon's visit to China. And I do think that is one of those really hinge events. Because what happened when Nixon went to China was that the nature of the international order in Asia, the way states in Asia, particularly Asia's most powerful states, started relating to one another, changed very significantly for a century. Asia had before then, Asia's international system and the way states related to one another had been characterised by very intense competition between Asia's strongest powers. And it was a pretty ghastly time. Then quite suddenly after 1972, Asia moved into what has been the most peaceful, and this is no coincidence, the most prosperous era in its many millennia of history. And I would say what's fundamentally shaped that, what's made, what's provided the foundations for all the developments that we've been talking about so far and that, so to speak, will, will make this century the Asian century, is the fact that strategic competition between states has been at an all-time low, and particularly strategic competition between the biggest states. And I believe that's been primarily because everyone in Asia has accepted American primacy. American, America has not just been the strongest and most influential power in Asia, but that its position as such has not been contested by others. And there was a deal there. That's what Nixon did in, with Mao in 1972. America welcomed China, which had been, for the 20 years before then, the most active contestant of America's position in Asia. America welcomed China into the international system and recognised the Chinese government. And China accepted American primacy as a foundation for the Asian order. Now, of course, that very success provided the circumstances in which so much that's happened in Asia since then in that last, last 40 years has been possible. It has made the Asia we know today. And in particular, of course, it's made the China we know today. It wasn't sufficient, but it was a necessary condition for China to be able to achieve the remarkable growth we've been talking about. But of course, it is China's growth and the massive shift in economic power that that constitutes and the that massive shift in strategic power which, which, which uh, that constitutes, which is now undermining the order which gave it birth. And how we manage that, how we manage to rebuild a new set of relationships which is as stable and congenial to economic growth and international cooperation as the existing order has been in this very different set of power relativities is the, the great challenge for Asia in the next couple of decades. The great challenge for Asia in the next couple of decades. Because we could get it wrong. There's no law that says that, that we can't make the same mistakes that our great grandparents and grandparents made that produced the century of really intense strategic competition and some really terrible wars 
in Asia earlier on. And it's a huge challenge to get this right because everybody's facing things they've never faced before. Nobody now living has ever lived in a world in which the United States had, did not have the largest economy. Nobody now active in foreign policy or for that matter economic policy has ever worked in an Asia in which the United States was not the most uh, powerful country in Asia. And few people, exception of very distinguished elder statesmen like Professor Drysdale, have worked in an Asia in which United States primacy was not contested. There's not too many people around who are in this business in 1972. So, all, all, all of us, some of my dearest friends, I wasn't, by the way. <laughs> but there's a very important point here. You know, we, we have got terribly used to Asia working the way it's worked. And of course we have, because it's worked like a Swiss watch. It's been a fabulous 40 years. But it's, been, it's worked that way because a very particular set of understandings between states about the way they relate to one another, and that set of understandings has been based on a very particular power relativity. China accepted a deal in 1972 for amongst other reasons because America was a hell of a lot stronger. And it would be unwise, to put it mildly, to assume that it will continue to accept that deal when those power relativities shift. Now let's just think about how that might work. And I'm going to do that by focusing very briefly on China's choices and America's choices. It's not to say that, for example, that India isn't a very important part of the story. It is. It's not to say that Japan isn't a very important part of, part of the story. It is. It's not to say the other countries in Asia don't have a role. They do. But the relationship between China and the United States is the current key question. 10 years or 20 years or 30 years from now, India might be really critical. In different ways, Japan is critical already, but it's the relationship between the US and China that's the most important, so that's the one I'm just gonna spend a bit of time exploring. The first point to make is that a deterioration in the quality of their relationship, escalating strategic competition between the United States and China is not inevitable. It's quite possible for the US and China to build a new relationship that reflects the new power relativities between them, which allows them to cooperate as effectively for the next 30 or 40 years as they have for the last 30 or 40 years. But it's also quite possible that they won't. It's entirely possible that the relationship will become increasingly adversarial, that rivalry will deepen, uh, and that as rivalry deepens, the scope for economic and other forms of interaction decline, and the risk of a war rises, and the risk of that war will be really big. I mean, a really big war, a nuclear war, rises. And it's the scale of that risk, the nature of that risk, that one has to keep in mind when one thinks about the choice that other countries have, that both countries have. Think of it from China's point of view. As China's power grows, we can be as sure as we can be of anything in this business, that China wants to be more influential. We can be as sure as we are of anything, that the, the, the Chinese people, let alone a government, are not going to accept that America should continue to be the leading power in Asia and China should accept a subordinate position as its power grows to equal and overtake the United States. Um, 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 imagine what a group of young Chinese your age must feel about China's prospects today and its place in the world and its place in the region and ask yourself whether they could be persuaded that even when China is a stronger country than America economically, which could happen very soon indeed, it should still accept American primacy. It's not going to happen. And at one significant level, it shouldn't happen. So what does China want? Well, some people fear that China wants to dominate the region in a harsh, militarised, hegemonic way. Think Joseph Stalin in Eastern Europe. That's never a possibility one can exclude. Sensible policy in Asia over the next few decades should always bear in mind that as a risk. But I've got to say there's nothing I see in current Chinese policy, there's nothing I see in the evolution of China's strategic position or for that matter in the evolution of its force structure that suggests that that is what any serious group in China aspires to today. On the other hand, I do think it's reasonable to expect that 
China would like to acquire in Asia the kind of leadership actually that America's exercised. Not harsh and militarised and hegemonic. Soft but serious and ever present. A little bit like the kind of leadership that America actually exercises in the Western Hemisphere under the Monroe Doctrine. And it would be an interesting question for all of us how we'd feel about living in an Asia which China dominated in that way. It could be a peaceful Asia if everyone accepted it. Um, and it would be different, it would be very different, but it's something we could perhaps live with. The key point though is I think the chances of everyone accepting it are very low. It's one thing for Australia to decide that we'd be happy to live under that kind of Chinese leadership, but would Japan? And would America accept it? I don't think so. And one of the peculiarities of our present situation is that although China is very strong and will grow, I think, even stronger, and not just economically but also strategically, it will not be strong enough to impose on Asia the, that kind of leadership uh, the way the United States has been strong enough to impose that kind of leadership on the Western Hemisphere. China will always face very strong strategic competitors. Japan is a very significant strategic power. Russia is a very significant factor in China's strategic calculations, which, just, which will always be there. India, of course, is significant, and America's not gone away. America remains a very significant player. So I think if China tries to, tries to impose even a relatively soft and benign form of hegemony on Asia, a Monroe Doctrine kind of hegemony, it's likely to face very severe competition. If that's right, then the prospects for a peaceful order in Asia over the next few decades are going to depend, amongst other things, on China accepting that and accepting that the most you can hope for is to move into a kind of collective leadership of equals in Asia in which it shares power with the United States and Japan and India. Much less, I think, than most Chinese would hope for and expect, but the most I think that China can sensibly expect to achieve without undertaking what would be for China as well as for everyone else a very sustained and difficult, demanding and potentially tragic strategic competition. But now turn the coin over and look at it from America's point of view. What are America's options? One option of course is for America to withdraw. There's no law that says that America will always retain the kind of very active role in the strategic affairs of the Western Pacific that it's had since roughly speaking the beginning of the last century. American leaders always say that they're an Asian power and they're here to stay. But when they say that, what they mean is they're here to stay as long as their leadership is uncontested. And I bet that's true. As long as American primacy is uncontested, the United States will remain actively involved. Why wouldn't you? Uncontested primacy is a bargain. But when your one's position is contested, and when you look at what the alternatives are, and I'll touch on them in a minute, a very short minute, then the, uh, then the, the role of uh, the, the, the idea that the, that the United States will inevitably stay engaged in Asia does not seem to me to be one we can take for granted. The, one, the, the first alternative, of course, is to compete with China for primacy. China starts trying to assert primacy, the United States pushes back and tries to achieve pri maintain primacy of its own. A very natural thing for the United States to do, I think, in fact, a default position for the United States. In fact, I think US, US policy at the moment, very deeply, very strongly held across, across American um, uh, political spectrum, is the United States should retain primacy in Asia, and if China tries to compete for it, they'll compete back. The risk of, for that is that it will escalate. It will provide a highly unstable and contested Asia. But if America's not going to withdraw, the only alternative to competing is to share power with China. Now, I said before, I think it's difficult for China to accept that, but I think it's almost equally difficult, perhaps more difficult for the United States to share that. It's a slightly melodramatic way of putting it, but what, we are, what that would require of America is that it's prepared to treat China as an equal. And that's a very big thing to ask Americans to do. On the other hand, America has to recognise that they have never faced an adversary as dangerous as China. Not because China's better armed than any of its previous adversaries. And certainly not that it's more aggressive as its intentions, but just because it's richer. China is already richer than the Soviet Union ever was during the Cold War relative to the United States. It's way richer than Japan was 
when Japan was a strategic adversary relative to the United States. It's way richer than the Nazi Germany was. The United States has never faced, since it became a world power, a country with the potential to overtake it in sheer economic size. And that makes China a completely different kind of strategic question for the United States than it's ever faced before. Well, very briefly, where do the rest of us fit into this? Both the US and China have got very big choices to make, and so have the rest of us. Let me just put it from an Australian point of view. What do we want? I would say that Australians want the United States to stay engaged in Asia because we'd much prefer to not live in an Asia which is dominated by China. On the other hand, we don't want to live in an Asia which is split between the US and China and distorted by US-China strategic competition. So we want the United States to continue to play a strong role, but we want them to play that role in a way that does not drive an adversarial relationship with China. In other words, for us, the share option, the option of the US and China sharing power, is by far and away the best. And I think that's true of every other country in Asia. But it's going to be very hard to persuade both the US and China to accept that. And right now, the trends are heading in the wrong way. The idea of an escalating strategic competition between the US and China is often spoken of as a future possibility. No, it's not. It's a current reality. That's what's happening in the South China Sea. That's what's happening in the East China Sea. That's what's happening in the development of their respective nuclear postures. We were already at the point where it's getting harder and harder to get back to a situation where we could negotiate a stable order between those two. Thank you. That uh, certainly puts uh, some big uh, questions on the table to discuss and you're going to move into breakout sessions after morning coffee to discuss uh, some of those questions with the panellists and among yourselves. But we, we will take 10-15 minutes now uh, to take questions from the floor to the panellists and uh, then have a final uh, statement uh, uh, from each of the panellists on uh, how they uh, they view it having listened to their colleagues on the panel. So, can I have a first question? Yep. Uh, take the mic and identify who you are and so on. Hi, um, thank you for coming today. I really appreciate it. Those are some great speeches. Um, I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, China seems to be. Uh, oh, I would watch all the way to it. Um, China seems Just to be. Hold the mic to your chin. Yeah. Uh, the production of alternative energies, uh, wind generators, and solar panels. Um, and there's a lot of growing official support for innovation in this area. And how do you think this affects the traditional leapfrog technology model um, for most of East Asia? Thank you. Who wants to go? Uh, we got a mic here. Yeah. Ross? I'll have a go, but I uh, missed a crucial second last sentence. <laughs> Uh, leapfrog technology, um, leapfrog technology, uh, yeah. Countries that have already been yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, a very interesting feature of uh, Chinese support for uh, it's, it's on. for low emissions technology across the board, not only in the energy sector but in cars, um, for the electric car. Uh, it, it, uh, a lot of Chinese enterprises and, uh, and some parts of the Chinese leadership uh, uh, see an advantage in, uh, uh, in completely new areas of uh, technology where China doesn't start behind. And I've heard this argued most explicitly in relation to the electric car. If you're, if you're competing with an internal combustion car, then uh, Detroit and Nagoya have been in that game for a very long time and very good at it. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and so you, you, you start behind and so that they, but everyone in the world is trying to invent a good battery uh, that allows an electric car to, to run for hundreds of uh, kilometers at reasonable cost. And uh, the, the, there is quite explicitly discussion in China of uh, how that creates an opportunity to to, to move in, in the areas of completely new technology right into the front ranks. And, and that, that is happening in some of these areas. But the, the, the technological story is different with every technology. In, in the case of the, the, the car, there the, uh, foreign enterprises have been, been invited in to, uh, to, to bring that technology with them. Recently, a, a, a joint venture with Volkswagen in Shanghai will 
my culture and my electric car. Um, uh, about uh, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, the uh, American investor, uh, putting a lot of money into a private uh, electric car company in um, in China because he thinks that they're doing well with development of uh, of technology. In the case of solar, China has quickly become the by far the world's major source of uh, solar equipment. Uh, that's actually based on uh, technology developed at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, their graduates have, uh, have gone back home and applied very directly that, uh, that technology. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the, theory, the theoretical part of the, the uh, technology is it happens to be world's best practice developed uh, autonomously at the University of New South Wales. Uh, and uh, the, the global technologies are undeveloped enough for uh, Chinese entrepreneurs, graduates of, of that school of uh, electrical engineering in New South Wales, just to set up new enterprise and, and very quickly develop a world leading position. Four of the six world's largest uh, producers of solar uh, equipment uh, are owned and run by graduates of the University of New South Wales in, uh, going back to China. So it's a, a story uh, that's different in different places, uh, but the fact that it's a completely new area of technology uh, does create an opportunity for uh, China to move more quickly to the frontiers than, than in other areas. Yiping, you want to come in on this? Uh, OK, we'll pass. <laughs> we'll take the next question here. Uh, thank you all very much for coming here today and sharing your thoughts uh, on the Asia Pacific with us all. We're very grateful. Uh, my name is Christian Jack. I'm from Peking University. Um, in Australia, I think we focus a lot on the relationship between the US and China, obviously, because we're so close to the US and given our economic interests in China. However, Michael Lowy has recently published a book called There Goes the Neighbourhood, and in it he talks about the, um, uh, the rising consumption of energy by China and India, um, and this energy is located in the Middle East, and the, the uh, transportation of this energy through uh, along the coastline south of India and, and up through the like Straits and um, up to China. Um, so I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts on the sort of the power dynamics. I know that China has a, a ring of, is it the string of pearls strategy developing uh, deep water ports uh, along that shipping shipping route. So I was just wondering if you kind of could share with us their thoughts on on the developments that are happening there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I'll feel, feel that one. Thanks, Christian. It's a very good question. Um, I've got to say, I, I do think that the way in which um, the, the, the competition for resources is going to be a very dynamic feature of um, the international system over the next few decades for the reasons that could, you know, several of the panellists touched on. Uh, but I've got to say, when I look at the future of the US-China strategic relationship, I see competition for resources as as much a, 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 a product as a cause, or perhaps more a product than a cause, of a deeper strategic competition which is based on status. Um, uh, in, in the end, uh, I'm not an economist, in, 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 in the end you, you can, if you let them allow markets, rely on markets to sort out who gets the oil from where, or the iron ore or whatever. Um, <clears throat> The sense what, what what worries I would think Chinese leaders, for example, is that is, is not that the risk that they can't go out and buy the stuff, but that um, they will be excluded from access to it by strategic or political deals, or that their or that the transport will be um, interdicted for strategic reasons. Um, uh, so I think the real the, the real underlying risk there is the management of the deeper relationship between the two countries to minimise the sense of competition. <laughs> However, having said that, obviously there will be a bit of effort to securing of, of the oil cell lines of communication, for example. Um, I think this is less difficult than people think. Um, uh, primarily because, uh, without getting too far into the operational details of this issue, it's extremely easy to sink ships and very hard to stop other people sinking ships. 
So it would be extremely easy for the United, for example, for the United States or anybody else to threaten to seek China's oil trade. Be extremely easy for China to threaten to seek peace. And as an operational situation where attack is easy and defence is hard, deterrence can end up being quite successful. I think it would be extremely hard for any country that's globally engaged in trade to effectively threaten anybody else's seaboard trade as a strategic manoeuvre without uh, attracting really unacceptable levels of, uh, uh, of, of retaliation. And for that reason, the idea that what China needs to do is to build a string of pearls and a whole lot of aircraft carriers um, to protect its energy sea lines of communication to me doesn't, doesn't hold water. Um, I think the terrorists will do the trick nicely and China's sea denial capabilities are now well and truly grown to the point where they could exercise very effective deterrence against anybody else. Yep, over here. Mm. Thank you very much for being with us today. My name is Paul Lashenko. I'm a captain of the United States Army, a graduate student in international relations and diplomacy here at AMU. I have a question for Hugh White in particular, but certainly the other panelists can chime in if they see fit. We've talked a lot about economic hierarchy in materialist terms, and it certainly seems to us that America's economic hierarchy in materialist terms is waning. However, there's also a flip side of hierarchy, and that's the ideational or relational aspect of hierarchy. In other words, states provide America legitimacy based upon an order that it can provide. So the question becomes, does China provide an alternative or feasible order that regional states will follow? Because my, it seems to me that even the concept of power argument overlooks uh, values and transparency is pretty important. Sounds like it's for you again, you. Hmm. Uh, yes, look, it's a really critical question. Um, and I'm going to actually touch on some of the questions that Deborah raised as well about how people see, for example, China's role in, in Africa. Um, I, I, I've got to say, I mean, I'm going to sound a bit sort of Marxist about this, um, but I do tend to think that economic weight is what really counts and that an awful lot of the other stuff that comes along with the way we talk about orders, the ideational stuff and so on, um, it sort of supervenes on that. Um, uh, I mean, this is going to sound a bit cynical, but what, what, why has America been the most powerful country in the world since 1880? It's because it's had the strongest economy since 1880. Um, uh, now, the way in which the order, and particularly the order that's emerged globally since the end of the Cold War, um, has, has evolved. Um, has given us something we're used to and something which works, works <coughs> extremely well. Don't get me wrong, if I had my choice, the US-led order would last forever. It's been fantastic for Australia. The question we face, though, is not whether we'd like that to continue. It's whether in the face of the fact that in order to maintain it, there will be no alternative, I would say, to either China continue to accept American primacy, which is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Or the US and China degenerating into an escalating strategic competition, which is happening. Or they share power, which is going to require the United States to negotiate the future of that order with China, rather than to specify it to China. Because that choice is so stark, because that, the starkness of that choice to me is brought about purely and simply by the shift in economic relativities. I think rather than be a bit nostalgic for what we've had, and as I say, I've loved it, it's to start asking the next question. What kind of order would we want to see negotiated? What, what, in the process of that negotiation, the negotiation that the sense the United States will have with China and then in some ways the rest of us will have with China, we have to ask ourselves, what in that negotiation is really important to us? What are we prepared to give away? How do we want that order to look? What are we sure it must not look like? Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's that focus on the essential elements of the future order which is really critical. Unfortunately, we're going to close off the questions there. I've got uh, one sentence answer to a question I want to pose to the panel as a whole, which is really about the management of this transition of power. If you look at the historical record, I suppose, precedents suggest that we've got a very mixed record in this respect. Uh, but I, I guess uh, the question is, uh, are the significant structural things that restrain in significant ways the conflictual element in the transition of this power that we're seeing in Asia. In one sentence or so, each of the panellists might come at that question. You've got the mic cue, why don't you start? Yes, there are. The very high levels of integration and interdependence significantly constrain the, 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 um, the rise of strategic competition, but obviously not enough, because competition is rising. Deborah? 
I think that um, the lessons of history um, are coming back not to haunt us in this case, but to pro provide us with some guidance. And I think that it's useful to look at uh, the lessons that have come out of all of four of the panel's presentations, even the lessons of the past 10 years, <laughs> which give us a little bit of history here. Um, and I think that, that provides for, um, for some optimism for working this out in the future, which is going to be your job. <laughs> um, I will make uh, uh, three quick points for you to consider. Um, number one, I think a transition of great powers in history did not always end up in military conflicts or wars. Um, so there might be uh, some hope, and I think the world is very different from centuries ago. Um, number two, we should recognize China is a transition economy. China is doing well in many areas, but that's, that does not mean we think this is the standard. We're still in transition and we're still changing. And the number three, China does not have any interest, in my understanding, to build a new system outside the existing system. We have been the main beneficiary, uh, beneficiary, uh, beneficiary of the existing system. And the, what the Deng Xiaoping said years ago about keeping, peace, uh, keeping a low profile in development does not mean we want to build our strengths now and, and, and challenge somebody else. We actually want to be a part of the system and we want to work with the others. So it's very important to remember whenever you think about the cooperation or competition, China doesn't want to build a system outside the existing one. Ross. The main constraint is that uh, the consequences of things going wrong are much larger in, in this relationship than in any other relationship between states in history. Uh, we've had one example of large consequences of complete failure of a relationship leading to the development of the ideas and the constraints that uh, uh, generated uh, <coughs> that allow the avoidance of the worst possibilities in, in, uh, when the first uh, nuclear weapons uh, fell on uh, uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, one would have thought it unlikely uh, that if uh, a great state rivalry emerged in the post-war period as it did between the Soviet Union and the United States, that nuclear weapons would not be used. Historically, uh, there had never been that sort of Constraint, uh, restraint on use of major weapons, uh, that ultimately uh, it was great wisdom in, uh, developed amongst a small number of people uh, in uh, intellectual uh, centers uh, and in government in Moscow and uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Washington, New York, and Boston that uh, uh, gave us that favorable outcome uh, is going to require uh, similarly uh, uh, deep and unromantic thinking uh, that uh, uh, applies uh, effective uh, restraints uh, in the United States-China uh, competition. Thanks very much. Uh, we now break for coffee, uh, then we'll have the breakout sessions, and then we'll return here for the wrap-up. Uh, I'll just ask Sam to introduce you.